Hi, and welcome to Bible Study with Friends. I'm here with my friend Ty Esslinger, and we are finishing the book of 1 Corinthians. This is part 38. We have spent 38 weeks going through 1 Corinthians in a in a verse-by-verse -verse study format. We've been enjoying our time together, and we pray that you have also. Today we're going to be talking about the conclusion of 1 Corinthians, but we're going to be talking about the five actions of Christian living. Paul is summing up the whole book with his last thoughts to the Corinthian church. And as we know from our study, the Corinthian church has messed up on a lot of issues. And now this is the last thing that's on his mind when he's going to address that. Now it's it's easy. We're going to go from verse 13 down to the end of the chapter. And it's easy to read this and say, well, that's this is just housekeeping. And it, there's not a lot here for us. But I think there is a lot here for us. And today we're going to be talking about the five actions of Christian living. And we're going to be doing that when we come right back. Hi, and welcome back to Bible Study with Friends. How are you doing, Ty? Doing well. We are going to finish today by God's, well, by God's grace. If I don't, if I don't keel over dead or something, we'll, we should finish today. Uh, it's been great being in the book with you, and uh, uh, I, I'm not sure we knew that we were biting off when we decided to do 1 Corinthians, but it's been a great study. We're going to be doing part 38, as I said, and this, we're going to start at verse 13. We know that this is a letter of correction to a troubled church. They've had trouble with fellowship. They've had trouble with, they didn't understand the gospel. Uh, he, he explained the gospel. He explained the law. He explained uh, interpersonal relationships that were goofed up, leadership in the church, uh, even the correct way to worship in the church. We, we covered that under the area of, of gifts. And now he's finishing up. We're, we're going to finish with one of my favorite things, Ty, and that is a list. Whenever I see a list in Scripture, I stop. And when you're doing a Bible study, if you get, if you get used to looking for lists and you stop, you can do a great Bible study just by looking at that list. And I want to look at those features today. What was on Paul's mind when he's talking to the Corinthian church. What's on his mind when he's talking to us today? And we'll be doing that. So are you ready to get into it? Oh, yeah. Have you enjoyed our, our first Corinthian study? I really have. Like, I'm happy it took 38 weeks also, because I just, I like, I like digging into it. Well, listen, I got to tell you, uh, the, the last 38 weeks are all Ty's fault, because... A year ago, I asked him what he wanted to study, and he said, 1 Corinthians, verse by verse. So this is all all Ty's fault, so I just uh -huh. didn't know. <laughs> but I'm glad we did it. It's uh, 1 Corinthians uh, is a wonderful book, and I'm glad we're into it. Let's get into these verses, and we're going to start at verse 13. Read verse 13 and 14. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Okay, now what what would you call the kind of statements that this that these verses are? Are are, are they a question? Oh, uh, okay. Be closer to a command. Okay, they, they, they are instruction. They are a command. This is instruction, and this is the last thing that he's going to give as far as instruction. Uh, he and then he's going to do some. Some housekeeping, like I said. Uh, we'll see that in a second. But he gives these commands. He's basically saying, okay, the last gasp is, I want to sum up the entire book of 1 Corinthians. So how am I going to sum this up to, to this church that I love these folks, and I've been there, and I, I want to help them? What are the things that I can say that will summarize all that I've been saying for 16 chapters. And we start to see that in these commands. And this is a list of commands. There are five things. 
So there are five actions that he is going to command them in the context of their church life and their Christian life. Five commands. And these, so this goes to us, right? Mm-hmm. So as we read this, one of the challenges is when, when you come to a list, you want to stop. You want to look at each thing in the list. You want to define what it means. You want to think about what it means. You want to meditate on it. And one of the one of the good ways to meditate on it is to is to kind of put it into your own words. So if we say the first command is be watchful, how would you put that into your own words as far as a command? So when I was first looking at it, when I think of when you think of watching, watching to me seems like a very passive action, right? Like you're not, you're not doing something. You're just watching, right? Okay. Like, okay. Uh, but a command does the a command to be watchful isn't passive. It's active. Okay. Um, so so let's go back to okay. If you're if you're on guard, if you're watchful, let's say you're a soldier. Yeah. And and. It's your turn for sentry duty, and the the uh, the sergeant says to you, "Okay, uh, be watchful." What what is an ingredient that's necessary for you to stay watchful through your whole shift? Yeah, when I when I was looking at uh, the Greek word and like some of the other ways that they that they kind of described it. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Give strict attention to or vigilant. And how would you how would you define vigilant, Ty? Like you're actively on the lookout for what's going on. And to be actively on the lookout, can you be sleepy? No. No. Oh, okay. So I, what I went with was this idea of be watchful is stay alert. And so many of us can fall into a pattern where we kind of get kind of comfortable in our Christian life and we get kind of drowsy when it comes to paying attention to what God is doing in our lives and what he wants to teach us and what we need to be learning, right? Mm-hmm. And so Paul is basically saying to us Christians, the first action of living the Christian life should be live it alert, live it on the watch, right? Yeah. Be, be listening to God. Be listening to each other. Be actively thinking about how you're going to live your day. And that's this idea of be watchful, be alert, pay attention. Now, it's interesting that in Roman days, if, if you were a century and you were a Roman and you fell asleep on your watch. They killed you. They could, they could kill you right there. There were a number of ways to do this. One of one of the interesting ways was um, the, 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 the officer of the guard would come along, he'd find him sleeping, and he'd just light him on fire and burn him to death right there. Another thing that they could do is they could call the entire company together, the legion. They could call the entire legion, and out of that legion, pull his cohort, his company, and they could have all of the men in the cohort who knew him kill him with swords so that literally your friends are going to kill you because you fell asleep on your so so Paul's first command is be watchful pay attention be alert and I could take that to heart in my Christian life and saying every morning do I get up do I get up alert do I get up alert to what God wants now there are there are mornings I'm sleepy yes but I can wake up wake myself up pour coffee down my throat and get alert and when I pray, I'm praying alertly. I'm praying with my full mind. I'm praying watchfully. I'm praying, what is God going to do to answer these prayers? And I'm watchful. That makes sense? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, the next one. What's the next one in the list? Stand firm in the faith. How would you put that into your own words? What does stand firm look like? Uh, the first thing I did when I got to this list was I pulled up all of the Greek words. Yeah, okay. Right? Um, stand firm. A couple of the other ways they used to describe it was to persevere or to persist. Okay. And and specifically, what are we to persevere and persist in? The faith. The faith. Okay. Right. And you can't you can't persevere with nothing opposing you. 
right? Okay. It's like, uh, and, and if it's you, implied. Let's go with this opposing thing. If people are opposing you, if people are giving me, let's say at work, people are giving me a hard time about my faith, my tendency is to do what? Not my spiritual tendency, but my, my natural tendency is to do what? My tendency is to try to kind of compromise and tone down my faith, right? Yeah. And that's not persevering. Persevering is saying, I'm going to stand firm in my faith, and I'm not going to compromise my faith. So I put it into, you know, uh, be, be alert is the first thing. Second thing is, don't compromise your faith. And there's a million ways you and I can compromise our faith, Ty. And, you know, we could, we could sit here and make a list a mile long of all the ways we could compromise our faith in our Christian living. And one of the most dangerous things about compromise, right, is that people don't, this is going to feel like a, like out of left field, but like people don't just like jump it, uh, like immediately to divorce with like no reason, right? It's a lot of little things that you know, kind of push you to there, yeah. right? Yeah. People don't commit murder. Generally speaking, people don't commit murder like just offhand, right? There were things that built up to it. Uh, uh, even And even if they commit murder out of passion, it's usually passion that flares up based upon a building up of things. Right. They finally explode and that they explode in passion and, and, uh, and do that. Yeah. So it's, it's the slow, constant compromising that gets you to a, an end result that you couldn't have pictured at the beginning. And, and if you take Paul's advice to young Timothy, for example, when Timothy becomes a pastor in First Timothy, but Paul basically says to him over and over again, stand firm on sound doctrine. We, we don't want to compromise our doctrine. There's a, there's a verse, remember the verse that says, don't, don't, be, don't be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Right? How how do you not get tossed to and fro? You stand firm. In fact, uh, it, our our verse from last last week, First Corinthians fifteen fifty eight, says, "Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the Lord." And that's this idea of I'm going to hold on, and I'm going to stand firm in my faith. So far, two pretty challenging things: to be alert in our faith, and and not compromise in our faith. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the next one is interesting. What does it say? Act like men. Now, is Paul being sexist here? I don't think I don't think so, but, um, man, genders, especially right now in America, are... Yeah, 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 yeah. Real, he, real he, hot Oh, button. man, he's only talking to men, but really not. If... if in fact, turn over to 1 Corinthians, earlier in our in our study, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, only three chapters ago, chapter 13, verse 11, and read what it says there. Uh, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Now, in that verse, is he talking about becoming a male person? An adult. You're basically talking about he, growing up, right? Right. He is a, he is male, so he referred to it as male. Yeah, but right. he's talking about basically not being a child instead of being that you you be a grown up. Right? Yeah. And I think this is the same thing in in context of Paul writing. Act like men. In other words, grow up. And the problem with the the First Corinthians church, and the problem with a lot of churches, the problem with a lot of us is that we don't mature. We don't set our mind on the on the mature things. We don't stay alert. We don't not compromise. We and we act like children instead of acting like men. So the third thing is really act like men. Now, if you take first first Tim, we're not going to go there, but First Timothy chapter six verse eleven. It says it basically defines what a man of God is, and a man of God is a guy is a man who takes action. He fights the good fight. He runs from temptation. He runs towards righteousness. He, this is a person of action. And he's basically saying, act like men. Be mature in your faith and quit acting like children. Because the problem in the First Corinthian church and the problem with a lot of us is we never grow up. 
spiritually. We want our own way. We want we want what we want when we want it. We, we anybody that gets in our way, we're mad at them. Mm-hmm. Uh, does that does that resonate with you at all? It does me? Yeah. When I was looking at the Greek word, one of the other ways that they said it was be brave. Yeah. Be be brave facing the world. Be you know grow up. Don't don't be a don't be a cowardly like a kid. Everything scares them. Get be grown up. Mm-hmm. Now the next one. And the la- the last two seem pretty self-explanatory. Okay. Be strong. Be strong. Now, my favorite cross-reference for that, I wrote it right there, is Ephesians 6.10. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So when he says be strong, he's not talking about, and he, he wrote Ephesians chapter 6, right? So yeah. he's, he's not talking about... Um, sit down and say, I, I, I'm going to be strong in my own strength. No, be strong in the strength of the Lord. Be strong in the strength he gives you. So, so far we've got be alert, don't compromise, grow up, and depend upon the Lord for your strength. It's a great list. A couple other cross-references to Ephesians 6.10 is Col- Colossians chapter 1, verse 11. And Romans chapter 4, verse 20, all basically say the same thing. Be strong in the Lord. Rely upon him to give you the strength. So if I if I want to put this into practice, I want to say, how, how am I to be alert? I'm to be alert by depending upon the Lord. How am I to stand firm and not compromise? I, I, I do not compromise because I depend upon the Lord for his teaching. How do I grow up? Well, I look to the Lord for maturity. Mm-hmm. And then how do I be strong? I be strong by depending upon the Lord and not trying to do it on myself. You want to get exhausted? Try to be strong in the faith by yourself, and you'll wear yourself out in a heartbeat. And then the last one, this is pretty self-explanatory, but think of it in light of the book of 1 Corinthians. What, is it, what does it say, verse 14? Let all that you do be done in love. Now, have, have they been doing that? Uh, no, they were suing each other. They were suing <laughs> each other. They were... They, they were taking were, sides. They, they, they were, were divided. They were sides. They were maligning each other. They were gossiping. They were they were not allowing people... Well, they were allowing people to get drunk in church. And, I mean, it's just all kinds of stuff, right? Yeah. And, and one of the things, 1 Corinthians 13, is one of the things they weren't doing is loving each other. And, and he makes an interesting command here i'm gonna i'm gonna love ty a little bit and i'm gonna do some things for ty out of love for him but only some things i want to do all things in love now i've got love for the brothers and sisters in the lord that's a that's a certain kind of love mm-hmm. but i also have love for non-believers in that i have a love of concern for them that's like god so loved the world that that love is a love of concern. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? So he has a concern. He has enough of a concern to let Jesus die for your sins. But once you've accepted Christ and you're in his family, he has a love that is this nurturing, close-knit love of a father for a child. And that takes that love to another level. So I th- I take from this that Everything we do, whether it's to believers or non-believers, we need to do it in the context of love. Uh, I remember in University of Hawaii, I used to go up to people and just between classes, we'd go up and we'd share the Lord with people. And it finally struck me that one of the reasons, in fact, the main reason I was walking up to people and sharing the Lord was to be able to go back to the staff of Campus Crusade for Christ and tell him about it. So I be on another number. Yeah, exactly. And I, so I wasn't sharing the Lord out of love for this lost person who needed to hear about Jesus. I was sharing the Lord so that I could report how great I was for sharing the Lord 20 times, whatever it was, right? Yeah. I remember shocking him because I, I went to him and I said, I'm going to quit witnessing. And he said, what? I mean, <laughs> witnessing for Christ was what we were about. Yeah. He said, what? And I said, look, I I have found myself witnessing the people thinking while I'm talking to them, thinking about coming back and telling you 
about how great it was to witness to another person. I said, and, and until I can, I can witness to somebody because I'm concerned that they're going to hell, I'm going to stop. And I'm going to spend some time thinking about why I need to witness. And it was based upon, I need to witness out of real love for the non-believer. And I need to serve in church and be involved in church out of real love for my fellow believers. So great list, right? Yeah. Great list. In fact, Don, in my notes, just to show you how this, how this can work in your Bible study, in my notes, I went down here. I said, the, the, our problem is that most of us are busy with life, but not active in the faith. We're not busy in living the Christian life. Mm -hmm. We're just busy living. Okay? And the five commands for action, for me to be an action hero in the faith, right? Uh, and that's, that's 13 or 14. I need to be alert. Not fall, don't fall asleep. Don't compromise. Grow up. Work out this idea of being strong. You don't get strong just by wanting to be strong. You get strong by working out. Now, I work out with the Lord. How much time am I spending with him helping me to be strong? And then the last one is be motivated. And what motivates me? What should motivate me? Love. So why, as a Christian, do I do what I do? I do what I do because I'm motivated by love for non-believers and love for believers. That's why we do what we do at Bible Study with Friends, to show and grow a passion for studying God's Word to help believers be better at their personal Bible study and help non-believers see what a real Bible study looks like. So we're motivated by love and concern for Christians and non-Christians. So that's those are my notes, and I took some... I took some, uh, I'm going to leave this for a second. You can stop the, if you want to copy these verses, you can stop the video right here and just jot down some of these cross references. I think you'd be blessed. I certainly was blessed with this, with this little Bible study. Now let's go back up here. Now after this list in verse 15, it says, now I urge you brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia. Now Achaia is that whole region around Corinth, basically okay. the Greek area, right? And he says, these guys were the first Christians in that area and that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Now, that's interesting because I can ask myself the question, have I devoted myself to the service of the saints as a Christian? If I'm applying these five things up here, I should be devoting myself to the service of the saints. And if somebody's not a saint, I should be helping them become a saint. A Christian. So he says, uh, they've devoted themselves. So then he says in verse 16, be subject to such as these to and to every follow, uh, fellow worker and laborer. Now, what's he saying in verse 16? It's interesting the, that um, the people that you're supposed to follow are people that are described as their service, okay. like servants, right? Pe people who are doing it. People who are serving. Right. Which, uh, the, which is kind of counter-cultural in a way, right? Because it's like, you don't think of leaders as the ones serving. Yeah, you think of leaders as they're, they're up there saying, hey, you come serve me. Mm -hmm. But real leaders, what did Jesus do? He washed the disciples' feet. He served them. And he was the kind of Messiah who came not to be political leader, but to serve people with salvation. The forgiveness yeah. of sins. And doesn't, the doesn't say follow the ones that are charismatic. It no. says follow the ones that are serving. That's right. And and not just Stephanus, who is serving, but also every fellow worker, in other words, worker, okay, and laborer, everybody who's really involved in the church, these are the kind of people you want to be subject to. You want You want them to lead your church. So quit trying to be political. And look at who is serving, and let them lead you. And if you've got a if you've got a pastor who's not serving you but wants to be served, you got an issue in the church, and you might have to find another church. There are great men of God who are pastors who are humble, and they are there to serve you, help you grow, build you up in the faith, and that's what we need to be doing. 
Now, I want to finish this very quickly because now we're into some housekeeping. Uh -huh. And he says uh, in verse 17, I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus. In, in other words, Stephanus, who was the first Christian in the area, he's been serving in the church in, first, in Corinth, but he's also been serving in, he comes to Paul, he's in Ephesus when he writes this. Okay. And, and they, they come to him to basically serve him. Because it says, I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus. These three guys came from Corinth. It says, because they have made up for your absence. In other words, you can't be here to minister to me. But these guys came from you, from your body, and have ministered to me. So they've made up for that absence uh, that you that you have with me. And, and I can't wait to come back. He says that a number of times. I'm going to come and visit you if the Lord permits. And then he says, the churches of Asia send you greetings. Uh, Aquila and Prisca. Aquila, or some pe people call them uh, Aquila. But, but Aquila and Prisca. Now, it's interesting. This is Priscilla. But he, he calls her by a nickname. Prisca. That'd be like saying, instead of Catherine, I'm going to call her Kathy. Okay. But he's being very intimate here, and this indicates that the people in Corinth, remember that Paul met Priscilla and Aquila in Corinth. They had moved from Rome to Corinth. Then they moved from Corinth to Ephesus. Then they moved from Ephesus back to Rome, and they're back there, and they're, they're saying, hey, Hi to you. Now this is this is still in the period they haven't moved to Rome yet. Uh, we we see in the book of Romans that they moved to Rome and they have a church in Rome in their house. But here they're still in Ephesus. Oh, uh, what do you think of the end of eighteen about giving recognition? Just just the idea that people who are serving should be recognized as servants and should be honored. Remember when it talks about honoring your pastors. Honoring yeah. your leaders, honoring people who are serving in the church. And this is just by by recognition of their service. And there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, listen, I, I really want to thank so-and-so for working in the nursery. And they're doing a fantastic job. Just kind of recognize him. Giving him kudos is basically what I what I see in that verse. Give Give those people who are serving in your church kudos. Don't just expect them to serve because they're serving. So we should treat our deacons, who are the main servants in the church, we should treat our deacons with recognition. We should treat our pastoral staff, our, our elders, with recognition, with honor. And that's what I see there. And he's saying uh, uh, Aquila and Priscilla and the, and the church in their house, they send a hearty greeting to you in the Lord. All the brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, this goes with this idea of brotherly love. This holy kiss is not, don't go around kissing everybody, but this idea of a holy kiss was, in reverence, you, you kiss on both cheeks. You greet, greet each other with kiss on both cheeks. And that's still, in the Middle East, that's still done today, is you, you greet each other with a kiss, but the, he wants them to meet, to, to, Greet each other in the church with a holy kiss. That is a mature, spiritually mature perspective on fellowship. And then he says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. In other words, this little section, Paul always used a secretary. But he wrote little greetings at the end of the book. He would say, I'm writing this with my own hand. Uh, there's, there's some other places where he does that. If you look over at, that, at the cross-reference. Uh, in Colossians 4:18 and 2 Thessalonians 3:17, he'll say stuff like, "I'm I'm I'm writing this with my own hand. Look at what large letters I'm using because he had bad eyesight, I, I believe." Anyone who does not have love for the Lord, let him be accursed. O oh Lord, our Lord, come. That's that's Maranatha. Come back now. I mean, we're ready for you to come back, uh, and that should be a prayer. And saying, if you try to live the Christian life and you don't love Christ, you're going to be a hypocrite. You're going to be just going through the motions. Yeah. And and God will not honor 
just going through the motions. If you don't love Jesus, you're not a real Christian, and you're going to face hell. No matter what your actions are like, you're going to face hell and being cursed to hell for eternity. If you don't accept Christ as your Savior and live according to his lordship, live a, let him direct your life and obey him. That's what being a Christian really is. And that goes up to the five actions of Christian living. And then he says, live by grace. The grace of the Lord be with you. And my love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Now this is, he's making this clear. Uh, I'm not just loving you because you're nice people. I'm loving you in Christ's name. I'm loving you because of Christ in my life. And I'm doing, I'm being obedient up there to let everything I do be done in love. So my love would be with you all in Christ Jesus. Now, what does amen mean? We use it all the time in our prayers. What does amen mean? I, there's a little hint here for you, Ty. <laughs> Let it be. Let it be. Amen just basically says, I, I agree. So when we pray, and somebody says, in Christ's name, and we say, amen, we're basically agreeing with the prayer and say, yeah, let it be, Lord. Let it let it be. And that's how he ends the book of 1 Corinthians. Listen, I hope this has been a blessing to you guys. We're going to end here. 38 weeks we've been in 1 Corinthians. It's a wonderful book. There's been some deep stuff in here. Even this last, this last few verses of this chapter. The five commands for Christian living. That's some deep stuff to think about in your own life and for us to think about in our lives. Listen, I hope this has been a blessing to you. If, if it has, please subscribe. Hit the bless button. I call the like button the bless button because when you hit like, it really blesses us that you're engaged with what we're doing. And it shows YouTube that you're engaged with what we're doing. So hit the like button. And I'd love to hear your comments. Um, comment on the five actions of Christian living in your life. Does it make sense? Do they make sense? Think about those. And is that a challenge for you to meditate upon? It is for us. And in the meantime, uh, Ty and I will be, will come back with another study in Bible study with friends. God bless you. God bless you, Ty. We'll see you soon in Bible study with friends. And in the meantime, we'll talk to you later.